Hello, I'm Alexia, and let me help you to take the fear out of birth with a mix of real-life positive birth stories and birthing experts sharing their wisdom. I'll also be sharing techniques for getting into the fearless birthing mindset. And join the Fearless Mumership community for bonus podcast episodes, access to free birth preparation downloads, and loads more stuff to help you to prepare for a positive birth. Join today at fearfreechildbirth.com. Hello and welcome back to the Fear Free Childbirth Podcast. This is me, your host, Alexia Leacher, and thank you so much for joining me today. Now, on today's show, I've got a real corker of an episode. Today, I'm chatting to Shalom Stone from Rockstar Birth Magazine and Rockstar Birth Radio, and I think the Rockstar Birth Academy as well. She She's basically an utter rock star, and she does deliver quite a few rock star quotes during the chat that I'm going to have with her today. And just quickly, what uh, we're going to talk about, because I do want to talk about something else quickly before I hand over to that chat. Today, we're talking about why the winging it strategy when it comes to birth preparation sucks and the cost of having a crappy birth. So this is really, really going to be brilliant. It's really important. And I think I always keep banging on about the importance of doing all the preparation and why and the positive benefits from doing that. But I'm going to flip it today and really look at, well, what happens if you don't? What happens if you do just go with the flow and just wing it and just not bother doing anything and just rock up last minute? That is what we're going to talk about today. It really is such an important episode. Um, so yeah, but before I have got some hellos. Now I've got, I've got a hello to Amy. Amy is expecting twins and it was Amy's, um, it was Amy that really got me to put out last week's episode. She emailed me saying, Hey, I really want some more information about twins. So I went on a bit of a mission and started finding somebody that I could talk to about twins. And so last week's episode with Mars Lord was thanks to Amy. So Amy, Amy's been going out maternity shopping. And so she's finding that she's got to buy stuff much sooner than most people because obviously she's got twins in there. So um, hello, Amy, I hope you're enjoying the podcast. And then I also got a big shout out to Rebecca. She's 39 weeks at the moment and she is looking to start clearing some head trash. She's in the head trash clearance method because she heard Grace's story and now she's really up for sorting some of her own stuff out. So Rebecca, Good luck with that. You know where I am if you have any questions. Other than that, I am going to be running a webinar on tocophobia. So if you have extreme fears of birth and or pregnancy, if you are, you know, if you are super fearful and you really want to try and clear it, maybe you're pregnant, maybe you're not, um, then this webinar will be for you. So this, I'll be diving down really deep into tocophobia, what the tocophobic traps that you might be stuck in that are stopping you from moving forward and getting rid of it and getting over it and all that good stuff. Uh, and then basically, how, what you need to do, what is required to overcome tocophobia. So that is going to be happening in the next week or so. If you can just stay tuned on my Facebook page, the Fear Free Childbirth Facebook page, and or the Fear Free Childbirth website on the homepage. When the minute I've got a date, I will put that on the homepage. Um, and that is it. So, okay, now back to today's episode. Today I'm speaking to Shalom, who is from Rockstar Birth Magazine. So you may know her already. Now she is a rock star herself. And the conversation that we have today is a really important conversation that needs to be had around birth. And, you know, one of the things I talk about a lot on this show is the need to prepare, the need to work towards your positive birth experience and how you can go about preparing. But one thing that I haven't covered really enough of, and that is what is the cost of not preparing? What happens if you don't do all that stuff? What happens if you just rock up to your birth and think that you can just wing it? That is basically what we're going to talk about today, because that is what Shalom did for her first birth. She thought, hey, I'm confident. I feel great. My body can do this. It's a natural thing. I'm just going to rock up and wing it. And that was not good for her. And I think that is what a lot of women do. And it is absolutely not the right strategy. So in this episode, Shalom and I dive down deep into really pulling apart the cost of a crappy birth experience. I hope you enjoy it. Well, hello, Shalom, and welcome to the Fear Free Childbirth podcast. How are you doing? Oh, very excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I am so thrilled to have you on because I have been admiring your work from far. You are the founder of the Rockstar Birth Magazine, Rockstar Birth Radio and Rock Your Birth Academy. And it's just absolutely fantastic to have somebody of your ilk on the podcast. Thank you so much for coming on. What I think the listeners are really going to love to hear is how on earth did you get to do all this great stuff? Like what is your journey to wanting to start something like Rockstar Magazine? So about 10 years ago, when I was pregnant with my first child, I thought my full extent of my birth preparation was, I've got a body 
I'm a woman, I'll be able to do this, I will just turn up at the hospital and I'll have an eight hour water birth. And that was it. And consequently, what happened was a little bit naive, was I turned up at the hospital and I had no understanding of their policies and procedures. I had no understanding of the physiology of birth or what my body was capable of. And consequently, I ended up with this really medically intense, intervention-heavy first birth. And I distinctly remember the moment that my daughter was placed on my chest and I went through this roller coaster of her being here and thinking, she's here and she's amazing quickly followed by how on earth did I get here I'm on my back in stirrups and there's someone between my legs stitching me up like this is not what I signed up for where did I go wrong what happened here and it took me a little while to unpack that and so by the time I got pregnant the second time I realized that my birth preparation had been desperately lacking I had done nothing and I just thought because you know, we give birth in a hospital, that they would tell me what to do and it would be all set up for me so that I'd be able to birth easily. And it just wasn't like that. And so for my next two experiences, I was insatiable. I absolutely sought out everything I could to have a positive birth experience, a powerful birth experience. I stalked women who'd had positive experiences to find out what they did. I read every book I could get my hands on. I watched the birthing videos. I just took the private childbirth antenatal class so that I could really understand my body and understand what I needed to do to get an understanding of, you know, those environmental factors that impact your birth and most importantly, to get the right mindset for birth, to really understand that mind-body connection so that I was fully stepping up to my birth, fully accountable, that I was, you know, wholeheartedly birthing with my whole being. And that experience was incredible because those two next birth experiences, I hired a private midwife team, I got my man on board and I just rocked it. Like I was on fire. I had the most powerful and passionate and sensual and voluptuous and oh my gosh it was just the most unreal experience it was so good that I literally did it twice in 12 months <laughs> oh my goodness. I, boom boom straight out because I just I just loved it and when we had the the third baby in quick succession you know the rock star dad kind of said to me hey baby we're done having babies and I was like right <laughs> what am I going to do with this information? Because I just had this whole, you know, stack of stuff and I thought pregnant women need to know this. You know, we birth is at the moment and pregnancy is such medical journeys, you know. You basically have sex and you pee on a stick and you go to your doctor and they say, well, who, who's your obstetrician and where are you birthing your baby you know it all becomes decisions medical decisions and you're onto scans and blood tests and other tests and it's just nothing to do with actually having birth there is zero birth preparation in there there is zero explanation about hey check this out did you know that if you take some of these actions and make some of these decisions you are far more likely to have a better birthing experience however it unfolds and so that was the passion I was like right so I created the Rockstar Birth magazine and then that wasn't enough I needed to talk to people so then I got onto Rockstar Birth radio and now I've got my beautiful online interactive digital program where I work with women every month to give them this information and to work with them on their own births to, to totally like I just want everyone to rock their birth because I want to be really clear right this is not I am not special I do not have a higher pain threshold or a magic vagina. You know, I just did the work. I just made myself accountable for my birth. I, I elected not to be a passenger anymore. I chose not to just wing it and go with the flow because I tried that and it sucked. And mm -hmm. so I went, right, you know, your birthing day is a massive moment that you never actually forget, and this is not just about meeting your baby, but that actual birthing experience. You never forget how you felt, how you were spoken to, the love and respect. You know, like it, it just has a ripple effect across so many parts of your, your life that you want to nail it, right? You mm. want to get it right. 
And I don't mean that in the sense that you have to have a perfect birth experience. I do think, though, that you have a great opportunity to influence and impact the likelihood of a positive birth experience. And that's up to you. And so this is the rally cry because I truly believe that we are born to birth. And I know that sounds crazy with all of the interventions and fear stories and all of the shit that swirls around birth, but I truly believe that as women, everything we need is inside us. We just don't know that yet because we're not taught that. And so tapping into that, tapping into your amazing birthing body and getting your mind in the right place, busting through your fears, you know, the incredible work that you do, like bringing all of that to the table and understanding how to birth so that you can give it your everything and have a really powerful experience. I love it. I love all of it. But I'm totally on the same page as you, as you know. Now, you mentioned that you winged it in your first birth. And I think a lot of women do that. And I'm just curious as to why Why do you think that you you winged it or you chose to wing it? What, what was it that you were, that's going through your mind, if you can think back then, as to why you think you could kind of get away with it in inverted commas? I think two things. I actually felt quite confident in my body. You know, I I actually thought, well, I'm a woman and I've got all the bits, so it will be tough. I've heard that. But, you know, I've done tough. I've I've done like half marathons. I'll be fine. And I truly thought that was the case. And you know what? I actually still believe that. But what I didn't appreciate, what I really just didn't know was the – impact that the environment would have on me that you know I basically turned up to hospital I didn't know the people I'd never met the you know the midwives that were on duty I suddenly had to forge a connection with strangers who were having this really intimate role in my life I was having vaginal examinations I was basically strapped to a bed with you know antibiotics and syntocin and all of these things pumping into me and all of these digital machines beeping and just thinking this is like a science sci-fi film like where is the natural birth in all of this where is the ability for me to get into my birthing zone and in addition to that I had nothing in my kit bag like my my desire to just go with the flow meant that I had not invested in anything outside of that so I just thought well I'll just I'll just do it I'll just turn up and you know it'll be fine and it wasn't and it was nothing like that and so I think that plus probably coupled with I didn't want to find out too much about birth in case it scared me Mm. you know if I thought about it I had heard I had an inkling about the horror birth stories or the you know the the crazy little comments that either friends and family or bloody strangers on the bus would say you know I remember having a, a woman at work who I had never met before in the toilets I was washing my hands and she just sort of looked at me sideways and said I was quite pregnant like six or seven months pregnant and she said are you getting scared yet I was just like what the heck like how do you answer that you know and so, but of course it seeps in, mm. right? It plants a seed of doubt. Yeah. And I, so I think I didn't protect my birthing bubble. You know, I, I didn't understand there was such a thing as protecting yourself from all that sort of swirl of negative um, vibes out there. And so I think although I had a trust in my body, I had no idea, no mm. concept of what mm. that environmental and energetic stuff could do to my ability to birth. Mm. It's funny you mention that woman in the toilet because I, you know, I, I wrestle with, you know, the fact that I, I say that I help women to get rid of their fear. And yet I, I use the fear all the time and I'm constantly asking them, have you got fears? What are your fears? And, you know, it's, you know and I keep worrying that I'm thinking that women are sitting there going, well, I wasn't scared until you started talking about all this fear stuff. And now I'm in a right old mess. And I think, well, yeah, maybe. But actually, the sooner you wake up to your fears, the better, because I get so many emails from women. And they're literally in week 37, week 38, or actually they're due any day and they're emailing me go, oh my God, I'm terrified. I thought I was fine, but suddenly it's all come to the surface. What can I do? I'm like, you've kind of left it a little bit late to be looking at this, like within two weeks of your due date. You know, you really need to start nailing this as soon as possible. So I've kind of, I was feeling really guilty about, you know, getting people to think about their fears, but now I feel less so because I think it's really important, like you say, to really wake up to this early on. So you can get into the right mindset because rocking up to your birth last minute with no prep is just not stacking the odds in your favor for a great birth experience as you experienced, right? Mm -hmm, Totally. And I think there's a couple of things with that. 
I think that there's an opportunity, and I do this in my in my Rock Your Birth Academy too. I say to women, we need to face and embrace your fears. Like acknowledge them. Let's not put our head in the sand ostrich style and think, well, if I don't think about it, you know, if I don't think about it, I won't think about it and it won't happen and then just turn up to your birth because in birth everything comes up to the surface. You know, you are at your most raw and vulnerable and powerful but you need to be able to be fully in your body and if there's a birth, you know, fear or shadow around you, then you're not going to be fully present. And so I think that facing them and I say embracing them and I guess what I mean by that is it's okay it's actually normal to have fears but you don't fear in the driving seat Mm. you don't fear making decisions Mm. bad decisions right it's but acknowledging them and facing them and and standing up to them and and kind of putting them in their place that I can appreciate and what you said a moment ago I think what the work that you're doing is proactively working through their fears you know it's taking them out of that ostrich style head in the sand and saying so what is going on for you what are your beliefs around birth what is your value system around birth what stories did you grow up with around birth you know because unpacking all of that you know is such a a tangible and powerful way that you can approach your birth it really gets you into a a good solid place and so I think there's a real difference between what happens a lot in our society which is that we're very quick to share the trauma of birth often in an offhand jokey way you know we'll often pregnant women will hear non-stop or you know don't be a martyr ask for the epidural straight away you know Mm -hmm. take all the drugs you know, or there's just, you know, we have this really funny way of dealing with birth as a society. And so I think that's really unhelpful. Whilst I fully appreciate that women who've had traumatic births absolutely need support to share and grieve and process them, I'm not positive that the audience for them is pregnant women, right? And Mm. Or they need to be in a position where they can share it in a way that is informative and empowering as opposed to scary and disempowering. You know, the last thing we want to do is give a pregnant woman, you know, fill her up with fear. So I think there's a different way that you can handle fear. And I think the work that you're doing is is doing that in a proactive, conscious upfront way mm. you know by mm. by smoothing the part the path towards a much more powerful and positive birth by recognizing that we all have fears mm. and i love what you said about having fear don't let it sit in the driving seat because it reminds me of something that elizabeth gilbert has written in her book um magic i can't remember the book's called but it's a brilliant book around emotional stuff and she talks about fear going you know you can't fear is along for the ride like fear is a natural emotion it's there to protect you and guide you sometimes it's a little bit confused and it's a little bit out of balance but you don't want to banish fear completely so in, invite it along for the ride be okay with it, embrace it, invite it into the car. But like you said, do not let it sit in the driving seat. Do not let it touch the radio. Do not let it pick the snacks. It just sits in the back seat and shuts up. And so it's this idea that embracing your fear and really acknowledging that you can have it by your side and every now and then you can listen to it to see, to check in with it, but certainly do not allow it to be the dominant thing that you're listening to because we can't banish fear. Well, one thing I'm very clear on is I do not try and banish fear from your life because fear is really useful. And if you didn't have a fear of heights, you'd walk off the cliff and die. So you need fear. But in the birth context, it's massively out of whack. And so we need to really kind of understand that you're not really in, you know, fear is completely controlling the physiology of your birth in that moment. And it's really making that birth experience, it's going to lengthen labour, it's going to make it more painful, it's going to make it more likely to be an unpleasant birth experience. And so it's not serving you in that moment, it's not protecting your life. In fact, it's adding risk to your life, having fear in the mix at that point. So it's really good to kind of restore balance with your fears. And yeah, you can keep hold of the fear that's there to protect you and stop you from dying. But you don't want to be having that fear out in the front seat at every single moment of your life because you're not at threat of death at every single moment of your life. So it's about getting balance back in. So I love what you're saying about not allowing it to be in the driving seat. And that's certainly what I try and do. It's like, you know, bring them on board, but put them to the side and know who they are, know where they are so that when they speak up, you know, it's your fear talking and not you, you know? That's so interesting. I shared something recently with my community where I said, make sure that you are the CEO of your birth. 
right? So you are the decision maker. You are driving this program. By all means, get yourself a rock star birth team, listen to them, talk with them, you know, but you make the decision so that this is not about my doctor said I have to. It's about you in consultation with your doctor making a decision or a choice that feels right to you. And so I'm really clear with women about putting themselves in that forward pivotal role and as soon as I, you were talking then I went I had a vision of you know a woman as the CEO of her birth and yeah look fear might be there somewhere on the board of directors or I don't know maybe making the coffee or in the mail room right so it's an acknowledgement that as you said fear plays a really important part of our lives but I think as you know th we just live in a society where everything about birth is based on fear generally and the more what that does is it takes us away from that true state of birth it takes us away from we we have no understanding of birth generally speaking you know we just as a society we have no concept of what birth involves the physiology of birth what hormones are working in birth how your logical brain can stop and stall birth you know and i think that we spend so much time focusing on fear and mitigating fear and so little time on actually appreciating what our bodies were made to do. Mm. You know, there are 7 billion people on the planet, right? There's something about our bodies as female mammals that means that we are made to birth. Yeah, and we've been doing this for how long now? And the medical scenario only just came into being in the last sort of 50 years or so, but we were birthing perfectly fine up until that point you know it's not like we can't do this and I think there's this huge myth that's kind of perpetuated is that we can't birth our babies on our own we need help we need medical help it needs to be in a certain environment in a hospital we need to have a doctor there we need to have this there we need to have tools we need to have machines we need to have drugs it's like no 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 no. you don't need any of that stuff obviously if there's a complication and a medical need yes but mostly, most women don't have those needs. You know, in the most part, you can just birth your baby in your garden. And I know that sounds crazy, but in your home, that's probably the, your home where you feel safe and secure and where you can relax is where you're going to have better birth outcomes. And it's amazing how the stats are just so low. Like here in the UK, the home birth stats are somewhere near 3% of births. And that is, that is just crazy for me because... I can't imagine, like every time I go into hospital when I had to go in for monitoring because my second birth was overdue and every time I stepped into the hospital, I was like, oh my God, I hope I don't go into labour now because this is the last place on earth I want to be when I kick my labour starts because the hospital environment just really makes me feel uncomfortable. I'd rather be at home. And yet women, some women believe that that's where they feel they need to be. I got a lot of girls when I was working, I said, oh, I'm going to go for a home birth. They went, oh, what is it? Don't you live near a hospital? I was like, no, that is why would why do you think I need to be in a hospital? And these were 20, 25 year old girls saying that, and and they believe that that's where you have birth. This idea that you don't have to birth in a hospital is really not even very well known, you know. So there's so many incorrect myths that are being perpetuated all the time that we really need to re-educate women about birth. And there really isn't any decent birth education out there when you think about it. The last thing that I remember learning was when I was at school watching some awful video of some woman on her back screaming her guts out. And that was my impression of birth. And we're not really educated about this. And yet it's so important for all women. What, this is such a travesty. I'm ranting. I know I'm ranting, but isn't it such a travesty that we're not learning properly and we have to get off our own bums to learn this stuff ourselves? Otherwise, winging it results in really crappy birth experiences. It certainly influences the possibility of that happening, definitely. Like I think the minute that we hand over our power to the hospital, like I did the first time, like I literally turned up and said, I'm here, tell me what to do. And, oh, my, they did, you know, mm. and that's how I ended up on my back with bright light shining down at me and, you know, all these things tubing into me. Like I just I handed over my power, the very thing that I needed to roll my baby out, mm. you know, and I think that the more that women take responsibility for their births, the far less likelihood of having a crap birth experience there is. Mm. And that's not to say, though, that you're going to have a perfect birth, right? I'm not about do this, then this, then this, and you'll get this. Because birth is magical and mystical and full of all sorts of valleys and troughs. And I just think that 
the reality is though that the more work that you do, the more investment that you make in your birth experience, the far more likelihood that you are going to have a positive and powerful experience, however it unfolds. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it's there's still that journey to go on, but you are far more likely to feel positive about your experience if you are still in the driving seat, if you put yourself at the center of your birth so that if you had hoped to have an eight-hour water birth like I had the first time and you'd done all the work and yet ultimately you ended up having an unscheduled cesarean, you would feel far more better about that if that was a decision that you made you know, based on all the options presented to you, based on you making an informed decision, based on you understanding how your body was birthing and where things were going, then just turning up with a, you know, vague notion that you'd like it to be an eight-hour water birth and then going through that crazy cascade of interventions that I did the first time and then ending up with a cesarean. Like then you're far more likely to go, what on earth just happened? I can't believe that happened to me. And mm -hmm. and go through, you know, find that a really traumatic experience, which is what happens for so many women because mm -hmm. they weren't at the centre of their birth. Their power was handed over and their birth was done to them. And I know we, a lot of the, I mean, a lot of my podcasts are like this. We talk about the positive birth experiences, talk about that, you know, if you invest in your birth, if you prepare for your birth, it can be like this. But, I, you know, just to flip it for a bit, you know, what is the cost of, of not preparing? What is the cost of a crappy birth? You know, what What if you don't prepare and you end up winging it and it ends up going pear shape? What's the impact of that? On so as somebody that th this happened to, what, what would you say to that? I would say that the day you give birth, you will remember for the rest of your life. And I'm not talking about the moment that your child's placed on your chest because you will absolutely remember that. But you will also remember every intervention. You'll remember how you were spoken to. You'll remember how much respect was in the room or not. You'll remember if you felt listened to and heard, if you were loved and supported. Like every, it's like your energy and your memory and every nuance of what happens in that room will stay with you forever. And it has this ripple effect across so many other parts of your life from that point forward, your relationship with your body, your ability to bond with your baby, your relationship with your lover, you know, your sense of strength as a woman. And that goes both, right, if you had a positive experience or a less than positive experience. So all of those ripple effects will take place regardless. So it really has a lifelong impact in terms of, you and your body and your relationships it just it's indescribable how impactful it is and so investing in that you know taking the time to step up to your birth and I think you know I work with women and I think it's a combination of things why they don't do that it's like some people are as I probably was the first time scared of finding out too much about birth actually easier for me to have my head in the sand and just turn up and get through it well, actually, it's not. <laughs> it's actually far better to do the prep beforehand, to step up and be accountable for your birth, to show up to your birth because of the incredible, powerful ripple effects it has. Mm. So I think there's a combination of people maybe being too scared to find out more. And then I think for those countries where women get birth for free in hospital, there's a question of like, well, why would I pay for anything? Why would I pay for a doula or a midwife? Why would I pay for a childbirth education class when I can just get it for free? Mm. And it's like because you don't understand what that means, you don't understand what the risks are of just turning up to hospital and winging it as I did, you know, not understanding all of the influences that that environment can bring and, and that long-term impact that it can have. And so it's funny because I know... As mums, we want to have to give the best to our children, right? So we save and we spend money on the amazing car seat or the cot or the matching daycare and all that stuff, right? I would implore you to scrap all that stuff. Like by all means, buy a pram and a car seat and a cot and definitely get safe ones. But they don't have to be the best of the best. But your birth does. Take that money and invest it in your birthing day, just like you did for your wedding day, just like you did for your 30th birthday. This is a day you will always remember. 
and you want it to be a gift to you and your baby, take that money and invest in your birth. It is the best possible thing to purchase, you know. It, it is just indescribable the impact that it will have on the rest of your life. Like do yourself that favour and invest in your birth. Mm. I, mean, I, I lo just love what you're saying because I, I totally agree and I'm just so grateful that I did do the time, you know, take the time. And it wasn't, you know, investing in your birth isn't, isn't just the money thing. It's also a time thing. You know, I get a lot of women writing to me and I'm saying, well, you need to just work through all these fears and clear them. They're like, well, I have got time. It's like, well, make the frigging time. Okay. Like if you want this to be a good experience, you, I'm sorry, but you have to step up and do the work. If you want that beach body, you're going to have to go to the gym and start looking at your diet. You know, you can't just wing it. You can't just think this is going to happen. And so that, yes, you need to spend the money, but you also need to think, you need to start getting engaged with that process because yes you can read about stuff you can read about the physiological stuff but when it comes to preparing your mindset that requires you to be somewhat more engaged in that process you know and for people to step up but I'm just I'm really interested in the whole investment piece and the money angle as well because you know when we think about how much women or families spend on the wedding or let's say on the nursery you know getting the lovely matching curtains and the bedding and 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 all the other bits that that, that you know all the all the collection of baby clothes that end up being worn for like once and then they all go on ebay you know all that money that is spent and actually you know how much should you know if we were to say look this is how much you should budget for your birth what kind of money do you think we should be talking about here for women thinking about budgeting for their birth well, I would definitely say that just because it's free, it doesn't mean it's good. Mm. So start from there, right? Just because you can birth for free, assuming you can in your home country, does not mean that's the, a good outcome. Mm. Okay, so starting there, then it's like, okay, so let's have a look at where do I want to spend the money? And I think this is where, as you said, you need to, I always say to my women, do one action read one positive birth story, look at one video, talk to one woman, you know, read one article about birth every day because you've got nine to ten months, right? Like it's a really long project so you have the time and just those small steps every day mm. can make such a big difference. So in terms of deciding how much it costs to have a great birth, that's going to be different for every woman but look at what's available. Who's on my birthing team? Is it just me and my man? Has he got a clue? You know, should we invest in a doula so that we've got a dedicated birth support person? Should we invest in a private midwife so we've got a level of medical, you know, knowledge and professional wisdom on our team and hopefully, you know, a buffer between us and the hospital system if we need it so that we've got someone else who can help us advocate for ourselves in the moment and, and you know, build that relationship with those incredible women over the time that you're pregnant. I mean, my private midwives that I had for my last two births were the best investment that I made because you got to remember, like, the number of appointments that you go to when you're pregnant, it's just crazy, whether it's private or public and you're going to see the midwife or the obstetrician. You can be sat in that waiting room for bloody hours. Mm. And I just remember those private midwives, I just looked forward to those meetings so much. They were like this absolute rock star team who were backing me all the way and we would spend an hour where I would be laid on the couch and they'd be getting me cups of tea and we'd be chatting through all my stuff, what was going on for me, what were my fears, what was happening and, you know, a little bit right at the end about, oh, well, you know, let's check your blood pressure and your fundal height but it wasn't about the baby, it was about me. You know, it was about getting me into that zone. And, oh, I love those women. Like I still, if I see them now in any capacity, I cry because it takes me right back to that moment. And I'm like, oh, oh my God, they were just, they're like family now. And so for me, investing in private midwives was incredible. I know other women who rave about having a doula at their birth. I know other women who choose to have a birth photographer mm. and or all of the above, you know, because that made all the difference for them. I would definitely, definitely encourage people to do a private childbirth education course, yours or mine, and or any of the amazing, you know, do what you feel called to, right? So have a look at hypnobirthing, check out Lamar's, you know, go to calm birth and just see which one really draws you in. Like listen to your intuition in birth. That's a massive thing for me. I think you are at your most intuitive ever when you're pregnant 
it's like you just have this incredible channel to your inner knowing, more so than any other time of my life. And I know this is all getting a bit woo, but birth is a bit woo, right? So Mm. listening to your intuition during pregnancy. And so if you are drawn to a specific childbirth education, go and investigate it. Do it. Follow that lead. Like lean into that because, you know, if you can have one or more of those things on your team, get your husband and or birth partner educated. You know, just all of those things are just so heavily influencing you and pushing you towards a positive birth experience. Mm -hmm. Like they're massive factors in terms of as opposed to not having any of them. Mm. They're incredible influences. Mm. And I'm just wondering, given the, the, the wide, the, the, the sort of scope of your varying different experiences that you've had, you know, in the, in the aftermath of your first birth, when you, had wing, when you had done the winging it approach, how did you feel? I'm just curious as to how you're feeling after your birth when you kind of came to the realisation that, that maybe it was that you winged it and maybe you shouldn't have done and how, what, what you're thinking, what you would, do to change that how you know if you could rewind time what kind of thought process was going on in your mind at that point I have these really distinct memories of certain parts of that day so I was induced because I had gone to 42 weeks and I didn't know at that time that I could decline induction you know the hospital said that's it come in tomorrow we're inducing you so I was like you know the eager puppy going oh okay and there are some really distinct moments in that day that have stuck with me. So, for example, I went through three midwife shifts. And so I had to connect with another woman, another stranger each time, this person that was going to be this critical role in my birth, but I'd never met before. And I remember each time I met them instinctively knowing, is this going to, are we going to gel here? Is this going to work? You know, and so straight away after my birth and in the weeks that followed when I, unpacked it and processed it in my own mind I was like right there were some of those women that I really clicked with quickly and just like in any part of site there were some that I had no connection with and so next time I knew relationship with a someone for a continuity of care was going to be key to me mm. so that was sort of the first one right mm. the second one was I'd spent nine months telling my husband no matter what do not let me have an epidural and after about six hours of the syntosin pumping to, into me, I was begging for one. And, you know, bless him, um, I think I was two centimetres at the time and I knew that I had hours to go, right? And I was just, I was like a mess. And, I, you know, I'm saying to him, give me an epidural, give me an epidural. And bless him, he was like, nearly there, babe, keep going. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm going gonna, just gonna, I'm going to punch him in the throat. Like I had nothing, you know, so next time round, I was like, right really want to avoid intervention. So let's get educated about what my rights are, um, you know, in terms of having induction and also really want to understand how does my body work? So is there anything I could have done to better prepare for the intensity of birth, albeit, you know, artificially induced in that moment, but really understand that there's an intensity to birth. So how best to manage that? You know, I was flayed on my back basically, you know, with all sorts of things tubing into me, I knew that that didn't work. So I was then all about, you know, doing a private childbirth course and I did a calm birth course here in Australia so that I could understand everything from breathing techniques to visualizations to body positions, right? So really getting into that sort of groove. And I just think back to right at the end of my birth, I had this great midwife had just come on and I'd really clicked with her. She was a rock star. And these obstetricians had come round, two female obstetricians, and they said, look, your baby's heart rate's starting to decelerate. This was, I don't know, 12 hours in. Um, We're going to give you another 10 minutes. Otherwise, we're going to come and help you along. And I, I had no idea what that meant, right? I had no idea. So I was like, okay. And so the 10 minutes seemed to go in a heartbeat and they're in the room and they've got me in the stirrups and my um I'd had an epidural and it was starting to wear off so I knew when I was having a contraction and I said there's this woman literally between my thighs unwrapping some scissors and I said to her this obstetrician I'm having a contraction like can I push and she was like you can do whatever you like like she was so disengaged she was like yeah whatever fine doesn't matter like she was you're having an episiotomy that's it and the midwife got in my ear and she said honey you do not want her coming near you with those things 
push as hard as you can right now, like go for it. And I, like my husband said later, he was standing by my head and he said he could see my scalp went beetroot because I was pushing so hard and my baby crowned. And the obstetrician went, can you do that again? And I was like, the midwife's going, you bet your ass you can. And that was it. I avoided by the skin of my teeth that episiotomy um, because I had this guardian angel whispering in my ear. But I had another person, right, between my legs in this like fairly vulnerable, exposed, you know, situation who was so disengaged. And so, you know, again, the next time I was like, that's it. I'm birthing at home. I do not want a stranger giving me vaginal examinations or, you know, threatening me with scissors. Like if I'm going to be naked and showing someone my vagina, I want to have invited them in, mm. you know. Mm. And so that was another that was another takeaway for me. I went, right, it's a private midwife team. I'm choosing to birth at home and I'm going to do private childbirth education and get really clear about what's involved. I am like backing myself all the way here. Mm. Mm. And. And that's what I did. So, But I'll never forget how I felt in those moments, you know. I'll never forget how that obstetrician spoke to me between my legs or how the other midwife earlier in the day hadn't really taken the time and just looked at the machines and the chart and said something. I remember she said something like, you've got ages yet. And I was like, oh, my God, screw you. But she was right. But it was the most disempowering thing. So, you know, I took those feelings from that birth, which were – I felt very deflated and disempowered. Um, I felt not depressed but flat afterwards because although I had this beautiful baby, it was not the experience I expected because I had just this vague notion of how I wanted it to unfold and I'd put no energy and mindset towards making it happen. And that was a massive learning for me that you've really got to step up. You've got to back yourself. You deserve it. You are an incredibly powerful woman. You might not even know that yet, but you, your mind and your body and your baby, they have everything you need to absolutely rock your birth. And most of the time you just have to get out of your own way, mm. you know, and those were the things that I used to back myself so that I could get into my zone and, and stay out of my you know, my fear space or the, you know, that sort of negative voice stuff. So, and, and to be honest, I mean, you know, this was your journey. You needed to kind of walk this journey. And if you hadn't had those experiences, you probably wouldn't have launched the whole rock star birthing machine that you have. So um, we are all grateful that you've had those experiences, you know, because women everywhere can now benefit from the fact that you've had that, that winging it experience and then the value of investing and preparing and how that has kind of helped you to birth so much more is just, you know, so I just think, just give you a big hug from everybody who benefits from, you know, engaging <laughs> with all your material, because I'm sure they are enormously grateful for everything that you put into that. So um, there's good in everything. You know, we might have a crappy experience, but we, as long as we learn from it, as long as we kind of act on it rather than wallow in it, you know, and I think a lot of women, those crappy experiences are so significant that they, they get stuck in it and they kind of, it, it kind of pulls them under a bit. And that's, that's the real risk, I think, that I think is worth talking about, about things like postnatal depression, because if you do if you don't prepare, you do, you are more likely to sink emotionally after the birth. And, and then you're more at risk for experiencing some of those things afterwards that really aren't entirely pleasant for many, many women. And they can spend a long time in those, in those emotional places. And for me, I know that was one of my fears. I, whatever, I did not want postnatal depression. I did not want, and I was prepared to do whatever it took to stack the odds in my favour for me to avoid that. Because I just... I'd read so much about that. You know, I work as a therapist in mental health, so I'm, I'm more than aware of how that can affect people. And that was, I think that was one of my drivers. It's that I know I can't guarantee that this is going to go amazing, but I'm going to do what the hell I can to make sure that I'm as far away as possible from that traumatic experience. And and, and I'm just going to do what I can to, to make that happen. And yeah, there's no guarantees in life. There never is. But I'm just so grateful that I took the time and, and put the, put the effort in really, you know makes all the difference and we're all going to have different drivers right yeah we're all going to have different things that that are going to you know give us that burning passion to have the birth experience that we're seeking and I think it's just about you listener tapping into what's special and unique 
and, you know, a value for you around birth. And one of the first things I do with my um, members in the Rocky Birth Academy is I ask them, how do you want to feel in your birthing moment? Not what does it look like, you know, are you all on fours in a pool, like all of that visualisation stuff, like we get to that, but how do you want to feel? And I give them this massive, incredible list of words that women before them have used to describe their births, inspiring, you know, powerful words and they look through that and or choose their own and it's so interesting to see once they have birth and how it's unfolded and all different flavors of birth right but they come back to you know I really did feel calm and peaceful those were the words I wanted at the outset that was the that was the feeling I wanted around my birth experience and it's amazing how once you've selected that and chosen that and you know put it up on your vision board how often their birth experiences go that way because they then it's like the universe then conspires mm. to make things land in a certain way and as you said before it may not be that it's that your birth goes exactly to plan but it's that you will still feel in that way because mm. that's what you're working towards. You're making an active decision. You're investing in your birth. You're mm. backing yourself. And it's just an incredible thing to watch unfold. Like I'm so blessed to be working with these women in this most intimate time of their lives, right? And mm. it's just it takes my breath away every time. It's absolutely incredible. And just to see women so powerful and so feminine and so warrior-like and roar their babies out, ah, no, gives me all the all the good shivers. I know, I love it. And I, the, the, the women that do the work, that apply the fearless birthing thing to prepare for their birth, I was chatting to a mum, and actually I'm going to share it on the podcast, and it was a, a Lady Grace, and she she was massively fearful of a birth going all you know all the thing the interventions the breach the c-section those were all her fears and she'd planned that lovely eight hour water birth i think in a birth center and all her fears came through and and it ended up being an emergency c-section but afterwards when she told me i said you know i'd love to you know find out about your birth and she's like it was the most positive empowering birth ever and i was like oh tell me she went it was an emergency c-section i was like say that again hang on a minute it was an emergency c section and it was positive and empowering she's like if i hadn't prepared if i hadn't faced up to my fears if i wasn't able to be really emotionally flexible on the day and respond and i chose how my c-section was going to go and i i made the decisions i wanted the drape and i wanted all this and and i feel so amazing and and we're now planning another one and like the little one's only like i know six or seven months and it's like wow what an amazing story that it can all go completely off plan and she still felt completely positive and empowered about it and she's can't wait to have another baby whereas so many women where that might have happened they've had that emergency c-section and they're like i'm done with kids i'm not doing that again and it completely you know they had a dreams of having big families and now they're just stopping at one because it was just too much for them to bear you know and so that could be you know again if you've got dreams of a big family and and that, that first experience is kind of terrifies you or is leaves that trace on you that means you just don't want to do that again how 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 is that going to impact you as a woman you know that that must be really hard to deal with so i'm i'm like you just so grateful to be helping women with this stuff amazing amazing absolutely anyway, amazing we could talk all day shalom so i'm going to kind of try and wrap it up now um but it's been an absolute pleasure having you here on the fear free childbirth podcast now for anybody that just wants to check you out and all your rock star birth stuff just share us a couple of links where they where you can drive them to where they can find out more about your work so it's all under rockstarbirthmagazine.com and from there you can access the magazines, the podcast, the academy, all jam-packed, confidence-boosting awesomeness for a fabulous birth experience in one place. Same for Facebook and Instagram, which is my new favorite thing. I'm Ooh. digging all the photos over there. And, yeah, online, every day, loving it. Brilliant. It's just so cool to be able to reach people all over the world. Like yeah. it's just this great, great connection. I'm loving it. Yeah, brilliant. Well, I'm going to share all those links in the podcast show notes. And I just want to thank you once more again, Shalom, for coming on the Fear Free Childbirth podcast. It has been unreal. Thanks for having me. <laughs> You've just been listening to me, Alexia Leachman, here on the Fear Free Childbirth Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Now, this is just a wee reminder that if you'd like to listen to bonus podcast episodes and have access to loads of birth preparation downloads, my video mini series on reducing your fears and so much more, then join the Fearless Mamaship community today. You can join at fearfreechildbirth.com. Until next time, bye for now.